All right, so get ready because today we're diving into a leadership book unlike any other uh, we're talking meditations by Marcus Aurelius. And you requested this deep dive to like level up your own leadership skills, right? Which is interesting because um, yeah, we're not talking about some like Fortune 500 CEO or some four star general. We're talking about an emperor. Right. Talk about high stakes. Marcus Aurelius was literally the most powerful man in the world, ruling ancient Rome. Yeah. And yet he spent his free time journaling about how to be a better person. Yeah. It's kind of like Peeking into the mind of an emperor practicing self-improvement. I know, right? And and what's fascinating is this isn't some guy who was born, you know, destined for greatness. The article we're diving into, 12 Lessons on Leadership from the Last Great Emperor, it points out that nobody expected him to become emperor. Really? But okay, I always just picture these historical figures just sort of falling into power. What happened? Yeah, so like it was a series of unexpected events, right? He was born to a prominent Roman family, but it was Emperor Hadrian who took a liking to Marcus Aurelius's character. Yeah. And then this led to like adoption by the next in line for the throne. And that ultimately set the stage for his reign. Wow, talk about a plot twist. <laughs> so he doesn't just warm the throne for a few years. This guy ruled for nearly two decades. And he earned the title of one of the good emperors, which says something considering some of Rome's, shall we say, less than stellar leaders. Oh yeah, for sure. And the article credits his grounding in Stoic philosophy as a key ingredient in his leadership. Yeah. Think about it. Amidst the chaos and pressures of running an empire, this is a guy who's finding solace and guidance in Stoicism. Okay, so we know he was a Stoic. But for those of us who haven't brushed up on our ancient philosophy lately, what does that actually look like in practice, especially for a leader? Well, I mean, at its core, it's about mastering yourself to lead others more effectively. Okay. The article breaks down seven core traits of a stoic leader. It draws on this book called The Captain Class. And the Captain Class looked at all these great leaders across history. And the first one, the first trait is being focused, fully present, prepared, and dedicated to the task at hand. That makes sense. I mean, you can't exactly lead an army, let alone an empire, if you're easily distracted. Any other traits that resonated with you? Yeah, absolutely. The second trait is being a true competitor, but okay. hold on, because this doesn't mean being ruthless or, you know, yeah. backstabbing your way to the top. So not what we typically picture when we think of like cutthroat Roman emperors. Exactly. For Marcus Aurelius and for the captains that this book, The Captain Class, looked at, being a competitor was about possessing a relentless drive to excel, right? Like to push mm -hmm. boundaries, but for the betterment of the team, or in this case, like the empire. Interesting. And, you know, that actually ties into the third trait, being selfless. Marcus Aurelius wasn't driven by ego or personal glory. He understood that true leadership meant putting the needs of Rome above his own. That's really interesting, because again, when I think emperor, I don't usually think team player, mm. but it seems like that was a huge part of his philosophy. Yeah, and that's such a great point and a really valuable lesson for leaders even today, right? Like this isn't a guy just concerned with his own power. He's seeing the bigger picture. And this wasn't just some abstract idea for him. The article actually points to an analogy he uses in meditations. He compares a leader to a vine bearing fruit. All right, I'm intrigued, tell me more. Okay, so I'm gonna quote Marcus Aurelius here. He writes, a vine producing a cluster of grapes, like a horse after its race, or a dog after its walk, or a bee after making its honey. These natural processes, right, they don't happen with an expectation of praise or recognition, they simply are. True leaders operate in the same way. Mm -hmm. They focus on the act of leading, serving, and contributing without needing a pat on the back. That's such a powerful image, this idea that it's not about seeking external validation. It's about doing the right thing, because it's the right thing to do just like that vine bearing fruit. And I can see how that would be crucial as an emperor, where it'd be so easy to let the power go to your head. And that's exactly what he cautions against. He emphasizes the importance of staying grounded and self-aware, no matter how impressive your achievements are, no matter your title. It's about what he called poise, not pose. Poise, not pose, yeah. I like that. But what does that actually look like in leadership? How can you tell the difference between the two? Hmm, that's a good question. You know, I think it's about humility, staying true to yourself, even amidst success. Okay. Someone with poise leads with quiet confidence and a focus on serving others. Right. While someone with pose is more concerned with appearances and personal gain. Have you ever seen someone in a leadership position who just remained remarkably down to earth despite their achievements? Yeah, that makes sense. I could definitely think of a few leaders who fit that description. So we've got focus, 
selflessness, poise. Hmm. What else? So we've got like focus, being a competitor, selflessness, poise, not pose. What other like stoic leadership secrets did Marcus Aurelius have up his toga sleeve? Well, the article highlights the importance of clear communication, right? Inspiring others through action rather than just words. Having the courage to stand by your convictions even when they're unpopular. Especially in a place like ancient Rome. I mean, those emperors didn't exactly have a reputation for being, you know, open-minded. You're telling me. But Marcus Aurelius was different. Like, he really embraced the Stoic principle of being open-minded. Mm. Um, in fact, the article actually quotes him saying, If anyone can prove me wrong, if they can point out my mistake, I'm happy to change. I'm after the truth, and the truth never harmed anyone. What harms us is to persist in our self-deceit and ignorance. Whoa. That's... That's amazing, especially yeah. for a leader of his time. It reminds me of something I try to practice as a leader. You know, this idea of strong opinions loosely held, being open to new information and like willing to adjust your thinking when needed. Exactly. And then finally, the article emphasizes the importance of emotional control. Okay. Which is like a cornerstone of Stoic philosophy. Right. Now, this doesn't mean suppressing your emotions entirely, you know? It's more about understanding and managing them effectively. Okay. It's about choosing how you respond to your emotions, not letting them just dictate your actions, right? It's like that saying, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. So how does this apply to leadership, especially in like these really high pressure situations? It's about being the calm in the storm. The article draws a really interesting parallel to Navy SEALs. Okay. They have a saying, calm is contagious. So in a crisis, a leader's composure that can inspire confidence and help prevent a situation from spiraling out of control. Right. That makes a lot of sense. I remember one time our team was facing this crazy tight deadline, a lot at stake. And like everything that could go wrong was going wrong. I could feel the tension just rising and everyone was looking to me for guidance. And I just took a deep breath. I channeled my inner Marcus Aurelius and just focused on calmly addressing each issue as it came up. And you could see the relief on everyone's faces. Just having someone stay calm really helped the team regain their focus and get back on track. That's like the perfect example of stoic leadership in action. Wow. And the article actually gives another great example from the world of boxing. Okay. Think about Joe Louis, also known as the ring robot, for his remarkably calm demeanor in the ring. Wow. The ring robot, that paints quite a picture. Right. Like, it, it wasn't just blind rage that made him such a formidable fighter. Right. It was his controlled strength and ability to remain calm and strategic under pressure. Right. Marcus Aurelius would have approved, I think. Yeah. So it's about mastering your emotions, not being ruled by them. Exactly. And that kind of takes us to another really interesting stoic principle that the article highlights. This idea that we're all interconnected. Exactly. Marcus Aurelius... He firmly believed that we're all part of something larger than ourselves, a concept he very much applied to his leadership. He often used the analogy of a beehive to kind of get this point across. I'm starting to see a theme here with these analogies. Yeah. First, the vine, then the boxer, now bees. Tell me more about this beehive idea. Well, so just as a bee's well-being is like totally intertwined with the health and success of the entire hive, Marcus Aurelius believed that a leader's actions should benefit the collective. Okay. Not just themselves. It's about making decisions with the greater good in mind, understanding that your individual success is ultimately linked to the success of the whole group. That's a really powerful way to think about leadership. Not as a position of power over others, yeah. but as a responsibility to serve something larger than yourself. <sighs> but that can be tough, mm -hmm. right? Especially when you're faced with challenges and setbacks. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, how did Marcus Aurelius approach, you know, responsibility? Yeah. So he believed in what we now call radical responsibility, which essentially means, you know, focusing on what you can control rather than wasting your energy on things outside of your sphere of influence. Okay. In Meditations, he writes, If we judge as good and evil only the things in the power of our own choice, then there is no room left for blaming gods or being hostile to others. That's a really powerful statement. It is. And the article connects this idea to President Truman's famous sign, you know, the buck stops here. Right. As a leader, you have a choice. Right. You, you can either blame external circumstances for your problems, or you can take ownership and focus on what you can do to make things better. So it's about choosing to focus on your own actions and reactions mm. rather than getting bogged down by like things outside your control, which, let's be honest, is a lot easier said than done, even for an emperor, right? Mm -hmm. Did Marcus Aurelius offer any tips for how to actually do that? He did. 
So he believed that a lot of our stress and frustration doesn't actually come from the events themselves, but rather from our thoughts and perceptions about those events. You know, so it's not about pretending that like bad things don't happen. It's mm -hmm. more about choosing how you're going to like interpret and respond to them. Exactly. And that's incredibly empowering. Right. Because it means that we're not just helpless victims to external circumstances, you know? We have more agency than we often realize. And that sense of agency can be incredibly helpful, especially in a leadership role. It's like you're taking back control of your own like inner narrative, right? Which can feel really powerful, especially when, you know, things feel kind of chaotic around you. Precisely. And it's something that, you know, Marcus Aurelius seemed really aware of, even when things were good, right? He constantly reminded himself not to let like success and power go to his head. The article even quotes him as saying, make sure you're not made emperor, avoid that imperial stain. It can happen to you. So keep yourself simple, good, pure, saintly, plain. Wait, he's telling himself the emperor of Rome to like stay grounded. That's wild. It really shows how these principles can apply to everyone, no matter what position you're in. Exactly. And it's a good reminder that success can be intoxicating, but true leadership lies in staying true to your values. And for Marcus Aurelius, that meant, you know, serving the greater good and never forgetting where he came from. Yeah. It's like they say, integrity is what you do and nobody's watching. Yeah. And speaking of doing, how did Marcus Aurelius approach like planning? Because it's not like he could just wing it as the emperor, right? You're right. Leading an empire requires strategy. And he was a big believer in what he called avoiding random actions. Approaching situations with a clear plan, kind of like a coach going into a big game. The so preparation was key for him. Absolutely. He believed that good leaders don't just react to events as they unfold. They anticipate, they strategize, and they have a framework in place. That's interesting. So like having a plan doesn't mean that you can't be flexible and adapt <laughs> as needed, right? Exactly. The article actually makes a really great comparison to Bill Walsh, the coach who, uh, you know, led the San Francisco 49ers to multiple Super Bowl victories. Oh, yeah. He was actually famous for meticulously scripting the first 25 plays of his games. Now, this wasn't about being inflexible. It was about having like a really solid starting point from which to adjust based on what he observed on the field. So it's like having a mental model in place, like you're prepared for different scenarios. so You're not caught off guard. Right. That makes a lot of sense. And all of this, this incredible combination of self-mastery, service, open-mindedness, strategic thinking, it kind of brings us back to what I find to be the most fascinating aspect of Marcus Aurelius, his embodiment of the philosopher king. Okay, so we've got an emperor who's also a philosopher drawing wisdom from the Stoics. Paint that picture for me. What does it actually look like to be a philosopher king in action? Well, for Marcus Aurelius, it was about bringing those philosophical principles to bear on his leadership. Right. He didn't just wield power. He contemplated it. He questioned it. And he really sought to use it for the betterment of Rome. Mm. And, you know, the key takeaway here is that you don't need to be an emperor to benefit from this approach. So we can all channel our inner philosopher king. Absolutely. I think so. Whether you're leading a team at work, a family or even just your own life, right? Right. Bringing this kind of thoughtful, ethical framework to your decisions can make all the difference. Yeah. It's really inspiring to think that we can all learn from someone like Marcus Aurelius, this guy who, you know, lived these principles out on such a grand stage, and yet they're still relevant to our lives today. Exactly. And that kind of brings us to a final thought for you as we, you know, we wrap up our deep dive here. Okay. If the Emperor of Rome, with all the power and the pressure that came with that role, right? Yeah. If he made time for self-reflection and personal growth, what's stopping you from doing the same? That's a great question to leave us with. It's, it's a good reminder that we can all strive to be, you know, a bit more like Marcus Aurelius. Uh. A bit more thoughtful, a bit more self-aware, and a bit more dedicated to using whatever influence we have for good. Couldn't have said it better myself. Well, that about wraps up our deep dive into the leadership lessons of Marcus Aurelius. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm a true soldier, never backing down, backing down. Resilience in my bones, I wear the stoic crown. Silent strength is my weapon, no need to make a sound. Unrivaled in my persistence, I'll always hold my ground. Hold my ground. Yeah.
wake up in the morning, feel the sun on my face Grateful for life, it's a precious embrace Martha said, think of the privilege to be alive Breathe it in, let the gratitude thrive Power over my mind, not the outside scene In the chaos of life, find the strength within So with wisdom in my thoughts, like a guiding light Running with the stars, in the cosmic flight I'm a true soldier, never backing down, backing down Resilience in my bones, I wear the stoic crown Strength is my weapon, no need to make a sound Unrivaled in my persistence, I'll always hold my ground Walker said everything we hear is opinion Not a fact, it's a perspective dominion Waste no time arguing about what's good and right Be the change, be the beacon, shine the light Anger's consequences, more grievous than the cause Best revenge, rise above, break unjust laws Be like those who bring the pain Stoic soul, immune to the toxic rain I'm a true soldier, never backing down, backing down Resilience in my bones, I wear the stoic crown Strength is my weapon, no need to make a sound Unrivaled in my persistence, I'll always hold my ground, hold my ground. Accept the fear that finds love with all your heart In the journey of life, play your part uh -huh. Soul died with the color of thoughts profound Marcus Aurelius wisdom echoing the sound Opinions ain't facts, perspective ain't true Stoic virtue unshakable from the roots Yeah, Be a good man, no need to debate Actions speak louder, let your character translate Fate brings us together, love with full measure In the symphony of life, find your own treasure Marcus said, the soul becomes what it thinks So we grab carving out mental links Marcus Elias dropping truth in the booth Stoic rap spreading wisdom, that's the truth Yeah, In the echoes of ancient philosophy I find my strength, my own autonomy Dwell on the beauty, watch the stars align Stoic mindset washing away the grind yeah. Happiness depends on the thoughts we mold In the tapestry of life, let the story be bold I'm a true soldier, never backing down, backing down. Resilience in my bones, I wear the stoic crown Silent strength is my weapon, no need to make a sound Unrivaled in my persistence, I'll always hold my ground My big well, takeaway of life is if you're constantly taking the easy way out, you're never going to callous your mind. I was a chameleon living in life who could barely get by. So I know that they were taking the normal mindset of people. They weren't talking about the one percenters, the people who want it like there's no tomorrow. Everything I didn't want to do is what got me to where I'm at today. It's about what you're saying to yourself, but it also comes with work. So whenever I was getting beat down, physically, mentally, spiritually, whatever I was going through, just saying, you can't hurt me. I had this haunting voice in the back of my head. A lot of us have it. We just ignore it. And it was there for years. So I knew in the back of my mind that I could pull off this whatever. Whatever I wanted, I knew I could. I knew that, but I, I was afraid of the work because I wasn't gifted with brains. I wasn't gifted with God-given talent as far as like athleticism. So I knew to get to where I had to go, to be on the same playing field as these men, to even try out for this program, I knew the work was gonna be something that I didn't wanna even, even attack. So I'll just put it off. It haunted me. That's what I realized for myself was I wanted that comfort zone. That everybody looks for that pat on the back they don't want to hear all the bad shit. they want to hear everything that they're doing right and i realized that's what kept me in this world that's what kept me in this world of not accomplishing anything what i did was i became that big bad nasty that you don't want to walk into at nighttime i became the roughest critic in the world on myself and that's what changed me i literally saw myself Everyone at some time or another sits down to a banquet of consequences. A man who is as wise as a serpent can afford to be as harmless as a dove.
The mind is restless and difficult to restrain, but it can be controlled through practice and detachment. Bhagavad Gita You need something to fall back on when you get depressed. Find something you love, something you can lean on to, something that would keep you going. Life isn't something you possess, it's something you take part in. You are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Jim Rohn. My reading, my learning, my, my workouts, my, my, my diet. You start neglecting all of that. You neglect one of them. You can, you can neglect all of them a long time. It's going to haunt you. When you start seeing that, my God, I haven't eaten right in a long time. I haven't been asleep right in a long time. It can only be one of those things to take you off. I'm very aware of my eating, my sleeping, my disciplines of life. If I started to get too far away from them, it's a hard stop. And the one thing, the only thing that gets me mad nowadays is that so many people die with untapped potential because they think that someone else is from better than them. And they were born not with the greatest tools. You need the ability to grind your ass into a fine powder. And when you're in that fine powder, find a way to build that back up repeatedly. And it's possible. When you come from a small, small town and you come from a place that a lot of people don't want to come out of it and get out of it, and all you want to do is become somebody, you've got to be able to get out and let your mind see open-mindedness. Because a small town, what it does to you is it closes your mind, completely closes your mind. Not everybody, this isn't everybody, a lot of people. You have to be able to go out there and create open-mindedness. You need space. You need space to see the world. Like a lot of racism, a lot of, a lot of ignorance in the world, it comes from people not being out and seeing other things, seeing other people. That's why we judge so harshly, because our minds are so closed to the reality of of life, period. Self-esteem was built at a young age. I had zero. So that's why that discipline for me was important. It takes nothing to be a loser. And that's why I hold most people to a higher standard because I know how little it takes, little, like little ability. Like you need no talent, you need no greatness inside of you, and you can still be a bad mother. What then disturbs me? The sea. No, but my opinion. Again, when an earthquake shall happen, I imagine that the city is going to fall on me. Is not one little stone enough to knock my brains out? What then are the things which are heavy on us and disturb us? What else than opinions? What else than opinions lies heavy upon him who goes away and leaves his companions and friends and places and habits of life? Now little children, for instance, when they cry on the nurse, leaving them for a short time, forget their sorrow if they receive a small cake. Do you choose then that we should compare you to little children? No, by Zeus, for I do not wish to be pacified by a small cake, but by right opinions. And what are these? Such as a man ought to study all day and not to be affected by anything that is not his own, neither by companion nor place nor gymnasia, and not even by his own body, but to remember the law and to have it before his eyes. And what is the divine law? To keep a man's own, not to claim that which belongs to others, but to use what is given, and when it is not given, not to desire it. And when a thing is taken away, to give it up readily and immediately, and to be thankful for the time that a man has had the use of it, if you would not cry for your nurse and mama. For what matter does it make by what thing a man is subdued, and on what he depends? In what respect are you better than he who cries for a girl, if you grieve for a little gymnasium, and little porticos, and young men, and such places of amusement? Another comes and laments that he shall no longer drink the water of Dirce. Is the Martian water worse than that of Dirce? But I was used to the water of Dirce, and you in turn will be used to the other. 
then if you become attached to this also, cry for this too, and try to make a verse like the verse of Euripides, the hot baths of Nero and the Martian water. See how tragedy is made when common things happen to silly men. When then shall I see Athens again and the Acropolis? Wretch, are you not content with what you see daily? Have you anything better or greater to see than the sun, the moon, the stars, the whole earth, the sea? But if indeed you comprehend him who administers the whole and carry him about in yourself, do you still desire small stones and a beautiful rock? When, then, you are going to leave the sun itself and the moon, what will you do? Will you sit and weep like children? Well, what have you been doing in the school? What did you hear? What did you learn? Why did you write yourself a philosopher when you might have written the truth? As I made certain introductions and I read Chrysippus, but I did not even approach the door of a philosopher. For how should I possess anything of the kind which Socrates possessed, who died as he did, who lived as he did? or anything such as Diogenes possessed. Do you think that any one of such men wept or grieved because he was not going to see a certain man or a certain woman, nor to be in Athens or in Corinth, but if it should so happen in Susa or in Ecbatana? For if a man can quit the banquet when he chooses and no longer amuse himself, does he still stay and complain? And does he not stay as at any amusement? only so long as he is pleased? Such a man, I suppose, would endure perpetual exile or to be condemned to death. Will you not be weaned now like children and take more solid food and not cry after mamas and nurses which are the lamentations of old women? But if I go away, I shall cause them sorrow. You cause them sorrow? By no means, but that will cause them sorrow which also causes you sorrow. Opinion. What have you to do then? Take away your own opinion. And if these women are wise, they will take away their own. If they do not, they will lament through their own fault.